Good afternoon. Hello. Welcome to the annual public lecture sponsored by the Rationalists of East Tennessee. I'm Larry Rhodes. I'm the president of RET this year. Rationalists of East Tennessee is an organization created to benefit people by expanding understanding of the universe through the use of empirical and rational methods. On most months, we meet every first and third Sunday. Um, at 10 a.m. for snacks and socializing, followed by presentations and lively roundtable discussions. Uh, beginning at 10.30, um, the subjects are both topical and timeless. On the second Sunday, we have a Skeptics Book Club. Uh, there, that would be at Books a Million at 2 to 4 p.m. if you're interested in that. Uh, you need not have read the book to attend, but of course it helps. On alternate fourth Sundays, we have the Reflections Gathering, which is a potluck, um, a chosen topic for a more relaxed discussion. It's usually held in a member's home. RET has, uh, is also a co-host with the uh, Atheist Society of Knoxville, a weekly call-in TV show called the Free Thought Forum TV, uh, most Tuesdays from 5 o'clock to 6 o'clock. How many people have not heard of it before? The Atheist TV Show in Knoxville. Very good. At least we reached two more people. Uh, we've been doing this for almost six years now. A public access Atheist call-in TV show. And nobody has heard it. Well, very few people have heard of it. Outside of this room, there are very few people. Um, you, right, right. Now, uh, you can be a co-host on the show. We're always looking for co-hosts. If you're interested in uh, any particular topic uh, or just um, being a part of the free thought movement going forward. Um, you just need to be at, talk to one of us. Uh, Forrest, are you here? There he is. <laughs> Up front. Uh, he is the uh, executive producer of the show and be more, hap more than happy to make you a TV star. Uh, uh, the show is on Comcast Channel 12, 5 o'clock to 6 o'clock every Tuesday. It's also on Charter Channel 194 and, of course, anywhere the Internet reaches at ctvknox.org. Uh, and, of course, you can also participate just by calling in the show. We also, how many, how many people knew this, have a radio show. How many people didn't know? <laughs> it's every Sunday at 6 o'clock, and I'm the host. So uh, if you'd like to hear rational, atheist music and discussion, uh, tune into 103.9, 103.9 WOZO Radio, or go online and listen to it there at WOZORadio.com. It's a low power, so it only really reaches downtown, but you can always listen to it live online. Uh, several times a year, we do a cleanup along our section of the Pellissippi Parkway. So we own part of the Pellissippi Parkway, so be nice when you drive through. And certainly don't throw, throw any trash down. We also have social gatherings for the solstices and other important holidays. The next such meeting will be June the 11th. Finally, RET sponsors an annual Free Thought Advance, or Advance. Uh, the year of the Advance will be held. The year of the Advance. Oh, I'm sorry. This year, the year the Advance will be held over Labor Day weekend. Last year was held in. Fort um, Townsend. Townsend. I can never remember the name of that town. Will it be this year? Yes. And I'm the president. I should know. <laughs> <laughs> The purposes of the Rationalism of East Tennessee are stated as, as follows. To foster an environment suitable for free speech to, and the exchange of ideas. To promote free inquiry into the nature of the universe and of human societies. To establish critical thinking in all aspects of human life. To establish the importance of scientific method. To model humanist ethics through service to the greater community. To explore ethical and intellectual alternatives to supernatural belief. Mm -hmm. And to provide a fellowship for people who share these purposes. 
If you are not yet a member of RET and share our outlook, there's more information flyers out in the rotunda. Membership is a reasonable $35 a year, or as Mad Magazine would say, cheap. <laughs> and, and it helps to promote free thought, rationalism, and presentations like this. We could not do it without those dues. You may also sign up at our website, rationalist.org. Now I'd like to introduce, oops, I've got a couple more things that I've made copious notes for. Um, how many people, this is the first time you've interacted with RET or seen any of their presentations? And may I ask, how do you find us? Facebook and my brother. Okay. Through a Through a friend? Okay. Friend. Friend? Okay. NPR. Sorry? NPR. ESPR? No. NPR. NPR. National Public Radio, I guess. Uh, ESPR, I hadn't heard of that one. <laughs> okay, um, there is also a Sunday Assembly, if you haven't heard about that. Adrian is here, she's the one who started here in Knoxville. Raise your hand. And it's a godless church. In other words, if you liked church, but you no longer believe, then you still have a place to go. Don't you, Adrian? And it's the singing and, and a celebration of life. Um, would you like to say anything else about it? Um, our motto is live better, help often, and wonder more. And it's a similar thing to RET, but more church life, mm-hmm. but minus the religion. Right. So. And you have a children's program as well. <laughs> and uh, RET helps fund the, the children's hospital. Yeah. Program. I'm not hospital. No. Okay. Um, let's see. That's about it. I'd like to pass on the program to Alita Ledendecker. She's going to introduce the host. And I need to wire you for sound. That one doesn't work? No, this is for his recording. Okay. Well, I'll just hold it. Okay. Well, you can let it down. Yeah. Okay. You don't have to hold it real close. How's that? Good. Good. Great. All right, so um, so good afternoon, and at this time I would like to ask you, in the interest of etiquette, please turn off all your electronic devices so they don't interrupt our speaker this afternoon. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce that speaker, Jerry DeWitt, who is an author, public speaker, secular minister, life coach, business consultant, who has been interviewed by the major news organizations numerous times in the past few years of his secular activism. These interviews include the New York Times, CNN, The Joy Bayer Show, Morning Joe, Time Magazine, as well as others. So Jerry's Christian ministry began at the age of 17. He evangelized in numerous locations throughout the southern United States, assisted at three Pentecostal churches, and later held the pastorate of two fundamentalist congregations. Busy guy. After more than 25 years of ministry, he realized that he had become an atheist. (laughs) and that his motivation in his pastoral work had always been humanism instead of religion all along his book hope after faith chronicles his early work and journey out of christianity copies are available for purchase and autographing in the rotunda after today's lecture Jerry now sits on the board of the Foundation Beyond Belief and is a former board member of the Clergy Project, of which he was the very first member to go public about his non-belief. Go, Jerry. Currently, Jerry is engaged in four projects. One, supporting the growing secular community in Louisiana and growing a unique online community at patreon.com slash Jerry DeWitt. Touring with his memoir, Hope After Faith. That was two. Forgot to count. Three. (laughs) Working with Bread and Butter Films to produce the documentary The Outcast of Beauregard Parish, which picks up where Hope After Faith leaves off. Four. 
putting his many years of public service experience to good use as a professional life coach and independent consultant for various in, various individuals, companies, and organizations. Jerry DeWitt, DeWitt still lives in DeRitter, can't even say it, <laughs> Louisiana, or Louisiana, um, with his family. Quote, skepticism is my nature, free thought is my methodology, agnosticism is my conclusion, atheism is my opinion, humanism is my motivation. Jerry DeWitt. So now let's welcome the man himself, Jerry DeWitt. Thank you. Thank you. Let me wire it. All right. Plug this in. Do you have a pocket for this? Yes, sir. I do. Thank you. All right. All right. How's everyone doing? If I get too loud, let me know. If I get too quiet, let me know. I, as you've already heard, I travel a good bit. And a couple of years ago, going up and down the altitude with the planes, my uh, eardrum, some weird way, inverted. And the sinus passages were very, very, very tight. And I wasn't able to hear out of my left ear. And I got accustomed to it. So I was given a presentation in a very, very small boardroom one day in Houston moving my jaw, talking, and it popped open for the first time in months. And I could tell I was just yelling the whole time. <laughs> With about ten people in this very small room. And for the first time, I immediately felt my face flush. I was mortified. And for the first time, I noticed the lady who was sitting closest to me was leaning away from me the whole time. So, so if I get too loud, I apologize. I don't know. I promise you, I'm not yet preaching. When I start preaching, you will know it. You won't have to guess. And I won't do it without asking your permission because I realize it does create triggers for some people. How many people have read the book? Oh, good. Let's go to lunch. (laughs) We've done this. Uh, The rest that have not read the book, how many are familiar with my story to some degree? Excellent. Okay, so there's a lot I don't have to repeat, so that's really good. So, uh, as has already been very well uh, put forth in the introduction, we do have a Patreon account. We would love for you to go there. Maybe after everything else is done, I'll play for you a video that I think you might will find interesting. Uh, The wonderful folks that are helping with the sound have uh, made sure that it'll work, and hopefully you'll find it funny. But, just like something similar to Sunday Assembly, uh, we founded Community Mission Chapel in Lake Charles, Louisiana, southwest Louisiana. And so we have a very similar mission there. We've had um, a lot of trouble getting it off the ground. Imagine that. Believe it or not, two days before a very special event, the event that actually CNN was going to eventually come and film, we had contracted with a local casino to use one of their spaces to have our service in. Word got out about who we were and what we were doing, and the casino found us unworthy for their establishment. (laughs) Now, just when I thought I couldn't feel any worse about myself, though the way you did describe my conversion to atheism made me, you know... (laughs) Thought sounds bad when you put it that way, um, but that definitely was was quite a kick for the casino to reject us. But that's just part of living in a world, as you're already very familiar with, where there's not even a battle. A particular ideology, a particular side of a conversation is dominated for so long that there is no conversation. So, if you don't know, let me just reiterate a little bit of my story and say that very early into my deconversion. As I was beginning to really process what was really going on. In, inside of, if you're not aware of this, within Christianity, within many forms of religion, there is the idea of free will and it mandates the idea of making a choice. You have to make a choice. You choose to believe. You choose to not believe. You make these choices. And so it makes sense that people from that side of the theological fence would think that atheism is a choice as well because they're making a choice to live by faith. They're making a choice to believe in something they can't see. And thus we must be making a choice to not believe in the same thing that they can't see. And so something that's very important to me is to emphasize that that it is not a choice, but in many cases it is a realization. 
It is an acceptance of something that is already real within you if you're being completely honest with yourself. I say that to say, if you don't know my story, I fought against this realization for as long as a person possibly could. To the point that I eventually came down to two conclusions, two options within my conclusion. I could be honest and simply walk out of this small guest bathroom where I had this quote-unquote epiphany. I could be honest when I came out and say, the bottom line is, I simply know that I don't believe. And I'm just being honest about this. I'm not against anybody. I'm not trying to turn over anybody's apple cart. Such a beautiful layered pun in the apple, but if you miss it, I'm sorry. But I'm not trying to I'm not turn I'm not trying to turn over anybody's apple cart. I'm not trying to be suddenly become part of this culture war that I was not even aware of existed at that time. I'm simply being forced by my conscience and by my responsibility to the people in my community who look up to me. I'm simply feeling obligated to be honest and tell you that what you think I believe, I now know I don't believe. I've realized. I haven't made a choice not to believe it because I actually did just the opposite for many, many years. I tried to choose to believe it because I never wanted to lose my community or even lose all the other benefits that come from believing. But I'm being honest. That was one choice. The other choice was that I could walk out of that guest bathroom where I'd had this epiphany And I could simply be dishonest about who I was and what I had realized about myself. I could pretend to believe something I didn't believe. Now the hook is, is that in modern day Christianity, pretending to know something that you don't know has been morphed into the concept called faith. And so in some weird way, I would not have been as dishonest as you might would suspect sitting where you sit today. Because I could have justified it. I could have twisted it and I could have turned it in my mind to say, yeah, I don't really, really believe that. I don't really, really know that. But if I act like I believe that or I act like I know that, then that's what the preachers are calling faith. And that's what I'm supposed to do is be faithful. But I was not there. And so I reached out. I got on the Internet and I Googled preachers who don't believe. And I discovered Dan Barker and all the great work that he's done. And with nothing but pure love and humanity in his heart, he returned a phone call that I'd made to his office. And he introduced me to the clergy project. Soon after being introduced to the clergy project, it opened up this world to me. Do you know that I didn't know you existed? I didn't know you existed. I I don't mean just you, this group. I mean, I did not know the secular movement existed. I had been in ministry for 25 years. I had traveled a fair amount of the country, and I had no idea that this was even an option of thought. Until that first Google search. And then I was completely amazed. And so he reached out to me, connected me to the clergy project. Shortly after that, I began to attend meetings. I began to make more contacts. Dr. Delray asked me to be the first director for Recovering from Religion, which I had the pleasure of doing for about a year some time ago. Since then, I've been on different types of boards and different types of organizations, but the one that I'm proudly serving now is Foundation Beyond Belief. How many people know about Foundation Beyond Belief? Most of you, good. Here's the reason I want to bring this up. I don't usually talk about all of this this much, but I'm, I'm, I feel like it ties in with what I'm going to say towards the end of this program. And my program is only about three and a half, maybe four hours long, so just <laughs> bear with me. Um, oh, y'all can't handle that? That's why you don't go to church. You can't handle it. So, um, but the reason I think it's important to bring up Foundation Beyond Belief is because many, many times as I'm interacting with people who are not part of the secular movement, they want to know, well, well where's the good that you're doing? The church world is the ones who's doing the good. The church people are the only ones who are charitable. Look up Foundation Beyond Belief. That is a fantastic place to start. That is a great place for you to begin to push people towards to show them that there is a form of humanitarianism that is outside of religion. So, our subject today, how non-believers can still help save the world if it's not too late. Anybody recognize this church? I doubt it very seriously. It's okay if you don't. It's a trick question. This is the Family Worship Center in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. It's the home of the Swaggered family. I get that every time. And I always... 
And I always want to say, where were you at? You know, back then, you know. Well, the truth of it is, what made you just groan, you know, if it's about scandals and so forth, had not happened when I was first introduced to this church. I was 16, 17 years of age, bright, tall, handsome, good looking. He's starting to tick me off. And, uh, and, and I walked into that church with absolutely no sense of direction, having no idea where I was going in my life. High school was about to be over, knew I needed an education, felt like I needed an education, but had no idea where I was going to go. Now, prior to that moment of walking into that sanctuary for the very first time, I had been raised in and around Pentecostalism. My grandmother, my grandfather were, you know, my grandmother in particular was the Pentecostal, you know, matriarch of our family and so I had I had been exposed to it some of my earliest memories is hiding underneath the pew while the Holy Ghost was moving and people were dancing and I was freaking out wondering what was going to happen next and trying to make sure my hand didn't get stepped on by somebody's high heel you know um, my earliest of memories is actually my grandmother laying my head in her lap with me suffering with severe earaches and her praying for me to the point of speaking in other tongues that's my earliest memory my earliest memory is, you know, words that can't be understood, which gives a reason for my vocabulary. So, so there was a lot of history. There was a lot of reasons that this place would instantly be significant to me. But the reason that I want to express today is when I walked into that sanctuary, upon a very, very large wall, there was a, um, a map of the world. There was, there was a flat globe up on the world in gold, and it was beautiful. And through the course of this camp meeting, it was a youth camp meeting that I was attending, the theme that kept, that kept surfacing to the top and eventually would be very, very obvious was that God was calling a group of young men and women into service to save the world. Now, can you imagine what that kind of idea did for a young 16, 17-year-old man who had absolutely no direction for his future whatsoever? When you add that on top of my religious experience and feeling like one day, I always thought one day I would get the Holy Ghost. That was our language, right? Get saved for the rest of you sinners. That, that one day I would get saved, but I would wait till I was old, right? And I'd already had all my fun and done all the fun stuff there was to do, right? Anybody else grow up with those kind of thoughts? So it's always in the back of my mind that one day I'd have to give an account for my life and one day I would have to surrender to Christ and one day all of these things. But I wasn't expecting it at 17. But when I I walked in completely without direction, completely lost, and I saw this map, and I began to hear this message about saving the world. It it caught me. Suddenly, I became part of a movement. Something I know that you can, you know, be familiar with. I was feeling the burn before anybody was feeling the burn. Right. <laughs> And so this idea of saving the world, this idea of being significant, this idea more than saving the world like I'm going to talk about in just the next few minutes, but literally saving souls from eternal damnation, this was a significant experience for me. This gave me direction. This gave me my calling. I felt called of God during those few days that I was to go and save the world. So, what has me here... Versus has me in other places because there's other people obviously that's read the same things that I've read. There's other ministers that would would espouse beautiful structures of apologetics in opposition to all the thoughts that I eventually begin to conclude. What's the difference? And and I think the difference in many ways is the strength, the underlying strength of my humanism. Even though I didn't even know that's what it was. I didn't know that's what it was called. I I really believe that from the very beginning, because as I just described, my desire was to save the world. I, I, I didn't mean save the planet. It wasn't the planet Earth that needed to be saved, but it was the people who reside on planet Earth that need to be saved. And I really feel like from the very beginning, my heart was drawn to serving people, to loving people. Now, we all know from biology that there's a selfish return loop, right, that comes. I give to you. You like it. You smile back to me. Makes me feel taller, right? All these things go on, right? And so it's okay. You can laugh at the jokes like that. It's okay. 
But the humanism at the very beginning would end up being the primary factor that would take me the direction that I ultimately went. And the reason why I illustrate that with the railroad tracks is because I feel like that there were two opposing, unfortunately, oftentimes opposing values within my heart. One, yes, was already a love for people, but the other one was also a love for truth. And the reason that I say they're opposing is because in my denomination, what was supposed to be true stated that 99.9% of everyone who ever lived, who is living, or ever will live, will spend not a million, not a billion, but an eternity in hell. 99.9% of every living soul will not be saved, will not live the proper doctrine, and will end up in hell for forever and ever and ever. That was what was known as truth. That was one rail on the track. But I had an opposing point of view. (laughs) An opposing point of view was, but I know God loves me. And, and, and I love God and I love people and if God loves me then He loves other people and so there should be a way that this shouldn't be possible that the truth would be everyone's going to hell but, but also that I would be loving everyone the way that I love them and that God must love them even more. So these became two opposing factors. And what I've noticed, especially in the last five years as I have I've met not just ex-ministers but other ministers that I was not meeting previously, different types of ministers I was not meeting previously, is that for people inside Christianity, that their rail of they love people more than they love truth, it makes them liberal. And they'll say to you, look, I know the Bible's got a few problems. Right? I know, I know that there's some issues with how it's been made, how it's been written, there's some politics. I know that. I know there's some problems, but look at the good that we're doing. Look at how many people we're feeding. Look at how many people we're giving hope to. Look at how many people we're helping. Look at the community we're building. Have you tasted the meatloaf? I'm telling you, this place is awesome. Right? And so that's one rail, and it draws people as they begin to encounter problems with their theology, or they begin to encounter problems with their religious community, it draws them towards a more liberal form of religion, where it's more about the people. But there are other people, there are other types of ministers that, yes, they they love people, but their love for truth is even more. Their love for truth is even greater. And that pulls them in a different direction. And whenever they find scriptures that they believe to be true, that talks about 99.9% of people going to hell, then they're forced to accept that. And they're forced to try to work that out in their minds. And they're forced to focus on the characteristics of God that, that relate to justice and holiness and purity. And that it's a shame that humanity has been tricked by the devil and that God really does want to love all these people and does love all these people and wants to be with all these people. But there's just this, there's just this spiritual economy that's locked in place. And because of God's holiness and because of God's truthfulness, He can't just override that system and just go save everybody because there's this thing called free will. And, and it's the system begins to be at fault. I see a lot of heads nodding. You know exactly what I'm talking about, right? And so their love for truth overrides their love for humanity. And they accept that truth and they balance it out just a little bit by saying, okay, I'm going to dedicate my life and my ministry to trying to see as few people go to hell as possible. Right? I've got a cousin that, that's, that, that he's that way. He's the worst pastor in history because he's such an evangelist. And every single service, whenever his church people, they're all saved and they all show up and they're expecting him to teach them something, he tries to get them all back down to the altar one more time, right? Because he's a natural born evangelist. He loves truth a little bit more than he loves humanity, but he does love humanity enough that he's going to try to save every single one. So what's different about me? What has us here today? And why is this important to how we can save the world as non-believers? Because there was a balance for me. 
between loving humanity and loving the truth. And it kept pushing me forward into the next line of questions. It kept pushing me forward into the next line of answers. I couldn't stop with being a liberal Christian because I had been there. I obviously couldn't stop with being a fundamentalist because I had been there. But the love, that balance kept pushing me onward and onward to try to find out what really was the truth and did it speak well for humanity. And so, the truth that I feel I've come to has already been quoted in the intro. What I know about myself is that skepticism is my nature. It always was. And a big surprise for some of you may be, I think a lot of religious people are skeptical. They're just skeptical about your stuff. (laughs) Not necessarily about their stuff, right? And we're all kind of that way in some degree, right? Somebody can always see something about us that we can't see about ourselves. But skepticism was my nature from the very beginning. I remember as a small child sitting out on my grandmother's front porch, my mom and stepdad had divorced, and so my stepdad was feeding me all the gifts that you give, you know, trying to trying to stay connected. And one of the gifts that he gave was this small little portable color television with rabbit ears. And if I set it in just the right place out on the front porch, then I could watch Star Trek. <laughs> That's what messed me up. (laughs) And I remember thinking skeptically. I remember how the episodes laid out and would make some things look obvious, but before the episode was over, it wasn't obvious. There was a different way of looking at it if you were only willing to open your mind to it and look at it. Skepticism is my nature. Free thought is my methodology. I try very, very, very hard to free myself from any institutionalized thoughts, any organized types of thoughts, and try to have free thought as my methodology. Once again, my realization is is that after 25 years of asking questions, I came out of the ministry knowing less than what I thought I knew when I went in. And so agnosticism is my conclusion from 25 years of religious experience. Based on all the evidence, atheism is my opinion. If Jesus shows up at the Super Bowl, my opinion is subject to change. It's an opinion. I know there are things I can only have an opinion about and not have an answer for. I understand that. But once again, humanism has been my motivation. So that brings me to the crux of the matter. Right now, all across... Now this may be where I lose you. And if I do, please forgive me and please love me anyway later on. Right now not just across this country, but across this planet, there are ministers who are riding that same rail that I was riding. Trying to accept things, or trying not to accept things, that they need to accept. My concern is, is that through examples like my story, Dan Barker's story, Teresa McBain's story, Mike Alice's story in Houston with Oasis. Through these stories, my concern is, is that we're creating an archetype. And that this is the only way for these people to be honest. That this is the only way for them to move forward in their life is that they have to do what I did. My original intentions was to commit what I call identity starvation. I was slowly backing out of the ministry. I'd taken on a regular job. And my hope was was that five, ten years later, people would not refer to me as Brother Jerry, but they'd refer to me as that guy who came and did that inspection at my house. Identity starvation, that old identity, I would starve it away. But instead, other things happened and I had to commit identity suicide. I had to walk out into town square and let people know who I really was and what was really going on in order to do some damage control in my life. My concern is is that there are very valuable people out there that can contribute immensely to our future that are only seeing one way of doing this. I think we have an opportunity to express... That loving people is still okay. That loving people is in many ways still very much our primary goal. If I were still an outsider and knew what I know now, it would seem to me that the secular movement is on the rail that just loves truth more than it loves people. And it makes it come across being more fundamental. I told you that I would probably lose you for a minute. I'll bring it back around with a joke in a minute. 
But from the outside, not so much due to any of us in this room, but due to the mechanisms of media and the fact that the only things that that draw attention are sound bites that happen on Bill O'Reilly, right? It gives the appearance to people like I once was that the entire movement is just on one rail. I see a few heads nodding. I haven't lost everybody, right? And what I'm desperately trying to do... I'm close to preaching. (laughs) Because I can feel it. What I'm desperately trying to do is I'm still trying to save the world. Not the planet, because the planet's going to be fine without us. Long after we're gone, the planet will still be okay. It won't be after the sun decides to take up more of the neighborhood, but it will be okay even after we're gone. I still feel this desire to save people, to love people, to show them that there's a better way. And I still believe that transferring that knowledge through the connection of love is still the better way. Now, it's not to say that part of my deconversion wasn't greatly influenced by Christopher Hitchens, because it was. But I was so much further down the road of thought by the time I watched one of Hitchens' debates that even though it still stung, it confirmed what I had already begun to suppose. It was not my introduction. This is where I might say, can I get a Darwin? (laughs) And so, my question now is, in this idea of secular humanism versus religious humanism, from our point of view, we see, let's just be honest, we see religious humanism as a sham. We see it as an opportunity. We see people who are trying, that we see expressing religious humanism, we feel like they're doing it for an ulterior motive. That they're creating homeless shelters and forcing the people who who reside in those shelters to attend service on Wednesdays and Sundays. Right? And we see that as inhumane. And I think we're right when we see that, that that's not the purest intent. But the reality of it is, is that so many people involved in religious humanism are not the leaders. They're not the people who are setting the agendas. They're not the people dictating the courses. They're not the preachers who are looking for a captive audience come Wednesday night or Sunday morning in the shelter. But they're the volunteers. They're the people who are there for no other reason than the fact that they love people. They're eating up their Sunday morning or their Wednesday evening or their time. They're doing it because of a love for people. I just wonder if there's any way in the world, and stay with me for this terminology, if there's any way in the world as we as humanists, secular humanists, if we can just somehow out Jesus Christ. (laughs) Because there's a difference. Because whenever you begin to talk theology and you try to parse and dissect the words of the New Testament and show believers that the the Jesus they think they're following inside the New Testament isn't as nice as they think they are, what you're really doing is you're really exposing them to the character of Christ, the Christ character in that narrative. But that's not who they pray to. And that's not who they worship. And that's not who they love. And that's not who they think they're feeling love back from. It's Jesus that they're in love with. It's the idea of Jesus they're in love with. The ultimate hippie. Bernie Sanders from 2,000 years ago. Right? right? That, that's what they're in love with. And, and so I'm just wondering how many people are engaged in religious humanism that actually, to some degree or the other, belong in the same camp with the rest of us. And in particular, from from my perspective, I wonder how many possible ex-preachers there are that have a role in sharing a pro-future message for the human race. I'm trying to keep from saying world because I don't want to confuse it with planet. The reality of it is, is that right now, now I'm, I'm no scientist by any means, and I'm just a novice for sure, 
But unless we're being deceived by 99.9% of the scientific community, the human species is in very serious trouble. Civilization as we know it is in very serious trouble. Now I understand the separation of church and state is literally worth dying for. I get it. And I understand that our political arm of our secular movement that functions in that capacity and brings the lawsuits, I support all those things wholeheartedly. I consider Dan Barker and Annie Laurie Gaylor to be some of my dearest friends. I support those actions. But from a totally different perspective, my concern is is that the culture war that's going on right now between, in particular, humanist theist and humanist atheist is something akin to a domestic dispute during a house fire. Did you feel that? Everybody with me on that one? I, I'm, I'm just going to say it again. Mom and dad are arguing over who said what in what way and what it means while the house is burning down and the children are still upstairs in their beds. There are generations yet to be born that will suffer the consequences of this house fire while we have spent our time and energy engaged in a domestic dispute. And the reason that we are not able to join hands and rally the troops that do exist. Here, here's a very good question for you. Now, I witnessed firsthand how the politics in Louisiana changed. If I wanted to, I could show each of you my phone, and I don't know why I keep it. It's some kind of sick form of twisted pride. But I've got a picture with me and uh, Senator uh, David Vitter. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And we're down in this... No. <laughs> no. Actually, he came to City Hall when I was the mayor's chief of staff. Now, can I stop there for a second? Are we doing okay on time? Are y'all all right? Are y'all wanting to tar and feather me yet? Okay. So think of this. Now, already by the time David Vitter came to City Hall while I was the mayor's chief of staff, our politics were diametrically opposed. And it had just hit the news about his phone number being on the phone, you know, of a madam who ran, right? And all those stories were coming out. And for whatever reason, little bitty Deritter, maybe that's the reason why, little bitty Deritter with 10,000 people was one of his very first town hall meetings after that. And being the mayor's chief of staff in a small town, I followed him and his, you know, his small little entourage into the bathroom, making sure they knew where all the facilities are at and what was going on. And I watched this man stand there as pale as that wall, in fear, trembling, because he had no idea what he was about to face in that little conference room or in that little council chamber. He was horrified. He was sickened. Now, I wasn't exceptionally excited by what he had done. <laughs> And I definitely didn't support him politically. But I'm a humanist. And if I could have, if I had stood in his humbled and mortified presence for two more seconds, I would have hugged him. Because I don't care what your beliefs are. I don't care what your mistakes are. I don't care what your theology is. I'm telling you, I still believe love is the way. Can I get a Darwin? Thank you. I get you to do that three times in a row, we'll pass the plate. <laughs> and so I can't help but believe that these ex-ministers, soon to be ex-ministers, or maybe they're not even ex-ministers, maybe they're just very, very, very liberal ministers. Right? I know you know some. I can't help but think that there is a way for us to utilize all of this energy, for us to utilize these skill sets, for us to utilize it by putting together messages that will be very much pro-future. Is there anybody in the room young enough or savvy enough to know what that picture is? Thank you. Thank you very much. So, <laughs> this is, yeah, this is from Minecraft. Very good, from Minecraft. Because this is, this is what we think, or hope, at least I always did, what we, what we hope is going to naturally happen. That somehow it's just all going to work out, right? It's just all going to turn out okay and it's, you know, we'll make that final discovery and it's all going to be alright. But the reality of it is, is, is once we pass through the bottleneck uh, of an oil crash, 
true oil crash where you don't have even plastics anymore, right? We are far more likely to be living in these communities. What will be the spirituality of these people? What will be? Just, just. I know I'm taking your time, but, but hear me, and I'm trying not to preach so hard. <laughs> we think... Oh my goodness, I could speak in tongues. <laughs> we, we think that what we're doing is that we're changing laws for today. We think what we're doing is that we're, 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 we're defending a particular worldview or philosophy today. But that's not what we're doing. We are shaping the face of religion of spirituality, of mythology, of history. We're shaping that for the future. The building blocks that the next thoughts will set on in the generations to come will come from the thoughts of our building blocks that we're placing on the ground today. We have the ability. We have the mechanism. We have the talent. What I'm desperate to see is for us to create an opening for liberal ministers, for ex-ministers, for them to migrate towards a pro-future message in a way that does more than just helps us with separation of church and state for the next lawsuit, for the next basketball game at the next high school, but for us to intentionally attempt to change the future in a way that is a win for everybody. So can we do that? Yes, we can do that. Because just a story as simple and as silly as mine has shown up in all these places. In all of these places, this has been talked about. I come from a town of 10,000. Right? I've got one half-sister. Not a large family. No money. No name that anyone would recognize. But the the telling of the story is important. And when you tell it right, people listen. Stay with me for a second. When you tell it right, people begin to listen. What if our message became so much larger than trying to simply overturn the theocracy that is trying to be created by the dominionist right now within our political scheme? I'm not saying that's not important. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that or we shouldn't fund that or we shouldn't support that. But what if a fair amount of us created and preached a message that is even larger than that? That's more far-reaching than that? Is it possible that in doing that, in truly walking out into the public square with being as naive as a 17-year-old boy can be, is it possible for us to create and capture a vision where we really could save the world? Where we really could keep future generations from having to live in small farming villages? But we could turn the tide on climate change? We could turn the tide on this ideology of stupidity? Of somehow that ignorance really is bliss? Is it possible for us to do this? Is it possible for us to get the word out? Yes, it's possible. What if the next ex-minister whose scandalous story begins to be told by CNN, what if, what if instead of the focus being on how much he is or is not like David Silverman, right? because that's what CNN spun it on last time, CNN followed us around for at least two solid days recording, filming at least, and in the little bitty segment that we got, they just pulled out the pieces they want to pull out to show that I wasn't David Silverman. It's like, are you serious? I fed you catfish for this? <laughs> what if the next time that someone gets media attention, it's a message of love? It's a message of unity. It's a pro-future message. What if the next time that someone looks at us, they don't have to search for our humanism to find it? (laughs) So with that being said, as I'm closing because I want to take plenty of time for your questions. All of this happened. All of this happened. 
And outside of polite, obligated pride that my mother would show, it's not that she wasn't prideful, but she was so fearful of what the outcome was, it was hard for her to throw 100% support behind everything that was happening, right? Because we were literally receiving death threats. I'm telling you, the bravest thing I've ever done in my life is mow my yard. Because I live at the end of this beautiful little street surrounded by woods. And I wasn't afraid of a single person in DeRitter, Louisiana. They may have stopped speaking to me at Walmart. They may have spread vicious and ugly rumors. They may have joined my Facebook page just so that they could talk crap about me on it. But I never was afraid they would hurt me. But I would receive phone calls from people who were stupid enough to use their own cell phones <laughs> and stupid enough to have put those phone numbers on Dominionist websites, stupid enough to say online that if we had to take up arms to get God's country back, we would do it, and stupid enough to leave messages saying, don't you think I will ever let you get away with what you're doing? <clears throat> I was afraid of the people who could drive eight hours and pull up in those little piney woods pull off a 22 round while I was riding on the back of my lawnmower and nobody would ever even have an idea where to start looking. That was the people I was afraid of. So while all this was going on, at the same time that I was desperately afraid, I'm only five foot five, so this stuff made me freaking proud. You hear what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, I was really, really proud of it. Whenever our story came out in Time Magazine, Time Magazine... Say it with me. Time Magazine. That's a big freaking deal. I was in my dentist office. And the uh, dentist assistant was a young lady that I dated for about 15 minutes when I was about 15 years old. Sweet as she can be. I'm laying in that chair, looking over my feet. She's going in and out. She's taking x-rays and doing... Th doing things and over my feet I see a magazine rack <laughs> I know that cover if I've never known any other cover and I could not bring myself to tell her about it I watched her pass in front of it probably 15 times and in that little town in that little place I couldn't tell her about it. And I'm going to go one step further and say, and it's not because I was ashamed of or afraid that she would disagree with or reject what I have been doing. Is that fair enough? Can you read between the lines with that? What if that wasn't the case? So, one of my biggest complaints was that nobody celebrated with me. There were no parties, there was no streamers, there was no banners, there was no celebration whatsoever when all these things happened, particularly whenever the book was published. So you can imagine my delight last night <laughs> when at the little potluck dinner that many of you attended, that this is what I found. I finally got my cake. <laughs> You have no idea what that means to me and how much it endears you to me. That here, in this place, at this time, I finally got my freaking cake. <laughs> how does that fit in? It fits in because there actually is hope after faith. And there's love after faith. And there's compassion after faith. There's humanism after faith. There's caring and concern and cake after faith. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jerry would be happy to take questions. So if you have any questions, raise your hand. And I'll try to remember to repeat it. Yes, sir. Um, do you ever feel guilty about all the people who to the church and were baptized and all the you know, that's a, that's a great question. I've got, it, I've got it many times. Thank all of you that, who've made time to be with us today. Hope to see you again soon. Um, 
and bring cake. Um, Could you repeat the question? Yes, and so the question was, thank you, I just said I'd repeat it and then didn't repeat the first one. I'm horrible at this. So his question is, uh, do I ever feel guilty about all the people that I brought into church? Did you phrase it any other way than that? That's close enough, got into church, brought into church. Um, And so I've had that question numerous times. And I've always been quick to answer it, and I will, I will answer it the way I've always answered it, and then for the first time I want to add something to it that just recently has occurred to me. I never have felt guilty about anyone that I ministered to in my church days, whether it was someone who, um, because of something I said, decided to join the church or, you know, um, live for the Lord or get saved or anything. I never did. And the reason why is because I tried as hard as humanly possible, I think as hard as anybody could, to only say what I thought or at least suspected was true in any given time to my detriment and to the detriment of my family. Every time that I would, and it's just the way it happened, you know, it's not that the universe hated me or anything, but it seemed like every time that I would build up a little bit of success in one facet of Christianity, I would realize something new. And I would have to tear all of that down. And by tear it down, I either mean I would preach against it until, you know, all support dried up. Um, or I would have to leave it altogether and go start over somewhere else. Not, not geographically, but theologically suddenly start ministering to different types of people in different places. And so, so um, I'm not as concerned about the price that I paid, but my family paid quite a price financially, emotionally, for me trying to maintain a level of honesty. At the very, very end, uh, there was a moment when I suspected I might be a deist. And to ease my own conscience, I uh, went to the Internet and I printed out the Jeffersonian Bible. The New Testament, Jeffersonian New Testament, and put it into a folder, and I only preached out of it. Uh, but nobody knew it. And so, you know, you could rightfully judge me hypocritical or, or, or hiding, and, and I would accept that. Um, but I, even then, I wasn't, I wasn't preaching about hell, and I wasn't, you know, saying Yahweh was the greatest person ever. Or, you know, uh, basically, for the last few years of my ministry, it was, it was love your neighbor as yourself. It was really all there was. And to the extent that a very intuitive young man, um, he, he, was a, he was a fabulous character because he was, he was from... Um, he was from, doesn't matter, some Norwegian company, uh, country. And, um, and so he was a little bit of a misfit in our very southern community, and he kind of carried himself. Matter of fact, he, he was uh, designated to handle one of the youth services one time, and he served communion with Dr. Pepper and Doritos. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you, I had to work my ass off to fix that one. <laughs> that was that was a hard one to fix. Uh, but uh, but he walked up to me one night and said, uh, he said, Brother Jerry, if you keep preaching like that, you're gonna preach yourself out of business, you know. And so I was trying to be as honest as I could. And so I don't feel guilty about that. Now, what I do feel guilty about. Um, uh, some of my friends that I won over to the Lord, um, their lives did not turn out very well for various reasons. And um, and probably the one I regret the most is now still very much a minister. And maybe because I know him better than even the people that were in my congregation and so forth, uh, I feel like I feel like that I unintentionally greatly limited his life's potential. You know, that he had great potential and could have done a lot of other wonderful things, but now he's in a very, very fundamental, dogmatic life. And and, and I do have regret. And I guess guilt. But I may also have some type of neurological disorder, so I'm not always sure I feel guilty for what I should feel guilty about, to be honest. Yes, ma'am. Did you have any clergy that supported you outside the church? So, do I have any support from who? From clergy outside the church, from other faiths or whatever. Do you have any clergy? 
Sure, absolutely. Let me let me, um, and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna emphasize the ones who don't believe what I believe. Obviously, right? You know, people who are still spiritual spiritualist in some way. If you don't know uh, who I refer to as Papa, if you don't know Bishop Carlton Pearson then you are missing some fun. Anybody ever heard of Bishop Carlton Pearson? Oh, you need to Google him. I love this man dearly. I got to spend some time with him in Tulsa here just a few weeks ago. And um, and, and he is truly, as we would say in the church world, a prince, a prince among men, a prince of preachers. Um, and he's, 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 he's evolved theologically over the years. He played a, a major role in part of my deconversion because um, he came out, he was a... Uh, Church of God minister, um, you know, predominantly African American uh, denomination. He was a uh, protege of Oral Roberts, attended, you know, Roberts Oral Roberts University and um, television, you know, you name it. Very successful. Had a very very large church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and had a one of the largest um, events that would happen annually in all of Pentecostalism. And he realized he no longer believed in hell and had theologically really fought his way through it. And there's some great, there's a great documentary on him. I think NBC did a documentary on him. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, they're in the process of making a movie about his story right now. So this is a guy worth you knowing. And so, um, and so he began to bring in some of his mentors, his, his new mentors who were teaching him about there not being a hell and tried to move his very, very large congregation in that direction and it just all fell apart and, you know, he, he too lost mostly everything and, uh, but he's still very much mystical. He's kind of a new age version, you know, and, and I love it. I eat it up, you know. I attended. Um, he was preaching at uh, All Saints Episcopal Episcopalian Church in Tulsa, one of the largest in the country. And I went to his service and had a fabulous time. I told him afterwards. I said, "I hope it didn't bother you seeing an uh, an atheist worshiping during the service, because you know I understand it. I understand the the physiology of it. I understand the psychology of it and what makes it work. And now it's a tool within my tool chest to enjoy experiences that I choose to enjoy. You know, and I got in there and I worshipped with the best of them and cried and clapped and raised my hands and sang the songs and walked out just exactly the same person I was when I walked in, just feeling a little refreshed and, you know, feeling good. You know, and, and, and that kind of is typical of me in a lot of ways. The media has always cast me as having gone to the other side of the fence. But I don't even use the phrase intentionally losing my faith because I don't feel like I've lost anything. I feel like I graduated from my religion. I feel like my religion was a test of my humanism and that I passed the test for the sake of, of humanity. And so, um, so you know, I enjoy going into those services and having a good time with them and being the only atheist in there speaking in tongues. <laughs> <laughs> I knew if I just kept trying, I'd push you a little bit too far. <laughs> That's my nature. Ask my wife. Yeah. Yes, sir. And there's others. There's there's other ministers too. There, there's others. Yes, I sir. heard your story, and yes. I'm fixed on that little boy of 17 years old. Me too. But let me even go back a little earlier. Mm -hmm. When you were 14. Yes. Or when. Even in Doretta, there are other children age 14 right. today who were like you at that age. Right. Uh, I assume all of us at that age are much like our parents. We, right. we, we learn from them what they believe in our community and there's a lot of conformity. Yes. And if nothing, if there's no epiphanies, or they don't wait 25 years as you did and, mm -hmm. and saw things in a different way, they're on autopilot the rest of their lives. Yes. What what would you rather happen and how might it happen that that at that age people would learn more about what you now you now believe or what the people in this room now believe? How how can how can we change the mindset of young people so that they just don't stay on the autopilot that, that they have been Condition to stay on right. the way our society is worked. 
Did everybody hear that question? Everybody okay in the very back? You hear? Okay. Um, so what I, this is going to, and this is just off the top of my head with just a little bit of thinking about those subjects. What I would prefer have happen to those 14-year-olds or, or even younger. Um, I would love, if it were possible, for them to grow up in a world completely free of any form of fundamental Christianity or obviously Islam or, or anything else like that. I, I, if I had a magic wand, I would wish that for them. Seeing that that's not the case, um, and probably never will be the case to the extent that maybe we would prefer, what I would love for us to do, and this goes directly back to my presentation, I would love for us to create using modern vernacular, a safe space for very, very liberal Christians or very liberal religionists of any kind to work with us on humanistic endeavors to such a degree, to such a publicized degree, that those leaders would truly become leaders within the, the, the landscape where people would see them and look to them as leaders and as examples of what a happy life, a good life, uh, a, a humanistic life could be. Because I think for us, a win, and, and, and by win, I mean if we're talking about a culture war that we seem to be engaged in, a win for us, and I think a feasible win, is for there to be proportionally as many cultural Christians as there are cultural Jews within Judaism. Everybody see that? I see a lot of nods and I feel like I'm getting some, some good feedback from that. Um, because I think, I think if Christians were able to have their traditions have their history, have their holidays, have their communities, and not feel, and I feel like this force is primarily coming from the political arena, but not feel politically or feel forced in any way to be as right, and by right I mean politically right or religiously right, as they are being forced to be, then... Um, there would be far more people who would admit to understanding separation of church and state. There'd be far more people who understand the necessity of uh, building a life off of reason and promoting the scientific method. Um, I, I think that there are 14-year-olds out there that would very naturally adapt to that or grow into that if the leaders were given the attention that they're given. But that's, you know, the, the very... Um, the very liberal, the very progressive Christians that I know of, they feel just as ostracized as we do. They're, they're just as disliked within their realms as we're disliked in other realms. And so they, they're not held up as guideposts or as leaders or, or, or as, as philosophical you know, shapers um, as they should be. So that's what I would wish for those 14-year-olds is that they're exposed to to that way of thinking. Does that answer that? I feel like I kind of went around it a little bit. Well, it's, your answer is as, as lacking in complexity <laughs> as my question. Okay, good. <laughs> there's, there's so many different Yeah, there's so many different ways. Yeah. Our country is yeah. alone. Oh, absolutely. That's right. That's right. Well, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson is, is um, I, I'll be honest with you, I, I don't want Neil deGrasse Tyson to come out as an atheist. All right, maybe already has in some way that I'm not aware of or I'm not, you know, recognizing, but I don't want him to do that because I don't want him to instantly be cut off from the millions of young minds that he can expose. My my recommendation, I, I speak at colleges all across the country. My recommendation for, for young atheists is don't worry about trying to be an atheist leader. You're in college. You're in college for something. Maybe you're in college for architecture. Be the absolute world-renowned architect. Maybe you're in college to be a neurosurgeon. Be the world's most renowned neurosurgeon. Be that first and let people find out about your atheism second. And that has far more effect on your credibility and your influence than in the reverse. 
That's my opinion. And what I base that off of, not feeling as much love on this, it's okay. But what I, what I base that off of is that when I, and it just so happens this is the way I came into the atheist movement, the, you know, the four horsemen just had, you know, really come to prominence. Or maybe it had been a few years, but was definitely new to me. Everybody know what I'm talking about with the four horsemen? Hitchens, Dawkins, Dennett, and Harris. Right? Have you seen those videos? I'm not calling them that. They're called that in a series, a video series, where they're sitting around talking about religion, called the Four Horsemen. And, and here's what I, I... I've got nothing to lose, all right? Atheism does not pay my bills, so I've got nothing to lose. And it's never going to pay my bills, because I've already been in religion once, and I'm not going to do it again. All right, here's what I feel like is happening among the leaders that I know in the atheist movement. And I mean leaders. I don't mean local or even regional. I'm talking about national leaders. This is what I feel like. I feel like everybody is fighting to take Hitchens place. Every blogger out there is trying to write the right blogs, sensationalize the right situation, and become the fourth horse person. All right, That's what I feel like is going on. I feel like there's a lot of really raw and naked ambition that's out there. Here's my concern with that. None of those four horsemen got to that level inside the movement. They got to that level because Dawkins was the premier evolutionary biologist. Then it was already renowned as, as a philosopher. All right, you know, I mean, and, and Harris the same way. And Hitchens had been a journalist and had taught the world about politics for decades and decades. And so these people were at a level. And then they acknowledged the movement, and that actually brought the movement up to where they were at, not vice versa. And so that's why I think, I, I'm saying things that people need to hear. I'm glad I'm recording it, and you are too. But, but I, feel like, I feel like it's important that we, that, that we go be the best and the strongest that we can be, and that our religion is secondary, and I think it has more of an effect then. So that's that's the reason why I wouldn't necessarily wish for the 14 year old to attend, you know, for every 14 year old to attend the next, you know, whatever convention or whatever. Not that that'd be a bad thing necessarily, but I just feel like there's a long term goal that we're not quite focused on yet. So, anybody else? Let's see. I think have I missed you? I think you've had your hand, yes, sir. Um, so in a sense, I'm going to try and answer Ted's question. Okay. And it ties in. Um, maybe with your horse persons and excelling. There's this statistic that uh, belief amongst uh, young people is way down. Sure. And I don't have children, and so I'm a little puzzled as to what might be going on that makes that, maybe making that happen. But I have a guess. Maybe people can confirm it or deny it. I've got but a one word guess, but I'll wait for you to I'm get there. Say Harry Potter. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's probably an interesting the, the take. The 14-year-olds yeah. mm-hmm. or even younger will read that. Right. That was happening in the late 1990s. They're young adults now. Mm-hmm. And as you go around and speak to more groups like this, yeah. it's about Harry Potter's action on their youth. Yeah, right. And that makes her name, the author, J.J. Roll? Mm-hmm. That Maybe she's the fourth horseman and we don't know. Her. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm saying. That's exactly, that's a great point. All right. um, you know, I think it's the internet. I think the internet plays an extremely powerful role. Now, the internet can't be all of the answer because radical Islam uses the internet as well, as well as radical Christianity and radical everything. And so it's not that it is an answer unto itself, but it's definitely a tool that previous generations haven't had. I mean, I I'll be honest with you, sometimes it ticks me off because I'll, I'll run into an article that in 14 bullet points will tell me everything that it took me 14 years to learn on my own at the library. You know, and, and I'm like, really? This is not fair. What else are these stinking kids going to get that I never got? You know? Um, and, and so, but, but I think you're right. I, I do think there are. One last little point. Are you all okay? We doing all right? We okay on time? Everybody all right? I don't know where all my, my guy posts are at around here. Okay. There is a, a, a overall religion that does exist that is never acknowledged. And everyone is a disciple of it to one degree or the other. And it is pop culture. 
And it is a religion. And it is handled the same way a religion handles itself. And it works the same way. And so that's a fantastic example. If, if you expose more children to those ideas, to other religions and their mythologies, than taking a clue from um, uh, Dr. Delray's book, The God Virus, then you really are. That's the vaccine. You are inoculating them against becoming fundamental, fundamentalistic about any one particular mythology because you've exposed them to so much. So it's another place that I wish I would have thought about earlier. I feel like we need to get better at is actually working within the religion of pop culture. Yes, sir. To what extent did theology influence your decision to leave the church, especially the theology of dispensationalism, which oh, yeah. I understand is now standard? amongst evangelical and Pentecostal churches? That is a fantastic question. If you didn't hear it, he's asking to what degree did theology play in my leaving the church or my deconversion in particular? Um, 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 dispensationalism. Dispensationalism. I've had another word stuck in my head. I was trying to still say dominionist. I don't know why. Um, I, when I first got exposed, dispensationalism wasn't something that was taught to me by... Um, so so discipline, if, if you're a student, and most people now are becoming that way, of the idea that God has, God has designated different dispensations throughout history, and each one of those different dispensations will do a certain thing leading into the next for you know, the coming of Christ or the coming of the kingdom, those types of things. That under this dispensation, it will was the time of Adam's covenant. That as long as you didn't eat of the tree, then you were good. You and God were good. Then later on, it would be a time of the Mosaic Law. And as long as you obeyed that, then you were good. And then another time, it would be a time of the blood of Christ. And then there might be something after that, you know, depending on what your theology is related to the tribulation and, uh, you know, the vials and the plagues and, and all of those things. And so that's that's that. But 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 here's here's how it played a role for me. First off, when I first discovered it. They've got these beautiful maps that's been drawn now for probably 150 years or something like that. I mean, it's been out for forever. These beautiful, beautiful timeline maps that fit my way of thinking. I loved it. I could see it and I was like, oh yeah, this all makes sense. And then that connects to this and it jumps over here. Here comes the angel. And I mean, it's just, it's just beautiful. I'm a visual person, so I absolutely loved it. But what it played into for me is it played into my skepticism and my desire for evidence. Because now, very much exposed, you had all of these pieces of theology placed on a timeline and they should be able to fit with each other without any contradiction or without any disagreement. All right? If you can just draw it out in one diagram and say, this is the plan of God for humanity, when then anybody ought to be able to walk up and go, oh, okay, yeah, it makes sense, it all fits together. And so it emphasized and, and continued to energize my desire for evidence, just as our doctrine of speaking in other tongues was considered to be the evidence that a person had repented well enough that they were now being filled with the Holy Spirit. So very early on, I was interested in evidence. And, you know, that tied in with it has to be testable so that it can be provable and, and those types of things. And so in a very broad sense, that particular theology played into that desire for evidence. And the fact that it was so contradictory to other, you know, everyone has their own idea of the timing, I'm not trying to dig down into it, but one of the things that you're able to get into whenever you're looking at dispensations is it should be able to predict when in particular the Antichrist is going to go into the temple and you will have the abomination of desolation which will create Armageddon and bring about the second coming of Christ. And if you do it just right, you know the date that this happened in this dispensation and that ties in with this date. And, and so that type of study showed me just how messed up it was, <laughs> how confusing it could be. Yeah. Yes, sir. According to a man represented as being a leading practitioner of dispensationalism, John Hagee, I'm sure you know. Sure. There are only three books in the Bible that apply to Christians. Revelation, Daniel, and Thessalonians, with Thessal Thessalonians being the Bible the book right. that's responsible for all these bumper stickers about are you rapture ready. Right, right. You know, I... I 
I would agree with that to an extent. I would have to go back. So, so what he said was, according to a uh, renowned theologian, uh, but it's not John Hagee, right? You just mentioned him, but John Hagee didn't say that, right? Oh, he said it. Oh, it's, oh, 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 it's, it's, it's Hagee that said it. Okay, so John Hagee said that there was only three books in the Bible that actually, um, that, that actually belonged to Christians. And it was the book of Revelations, the book of Daniel, which is the Old Testament mirror of Revelation, and the book of uh, Thessalonians, first or yeah. second Thessalonians. Yeah, he said that they apply to Christians. That apply to Christians. Apply to Jews. Right. And and they're, they're, I would have to go with him. I don't know so much about Thessalonians, but I would have to agree with that because there is so much within the New Testament, particularly in the book of Acts, that is relating the story back. Um, several times the Episcopals, the, the, the Episcopal... <clears throat> Need an actual coat instead of water. So many times it is it is literally detailing the debate within the theology that was housed within the Jewish Christians. There seems to be very little actual practical theology for Christians even within the New Testament itself. Which astounded me when I was challenged on that and had to try and go and find it. Such as if you study, say, you know, Buddhism or something like that, you can very quickly from those what they consider to be sacred texts find instructions. You know, do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that. This is how you achieve this, how you achieve that. The New Testament is not that kind of book at all. Not at all. And I was very disappointed to realize that. Anybody else? Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, do you think that do you know preachers right now that are in it just for the money, that just do it, they're preaching just for you? And would you say the majority of them are doing it just because it's their job and not they really believe it? Like, no. I, I, and, and this has been the hardest thing for me because I could have really been the atheist movement's champion if I would have come out and said, here's all the secrets and, you know, here's, here's how preachers, you know, they all get in the back room late at night and figure out how to mess with your mind and get the money out of your pocket. Um, but I, don't, I haven't had that experience. Now, I haven't been at the mega church level, and so I don't know what, you know, um, there's some that I think are probably respectable, you know, just from what I hear about them, but I, I don't know how they operate. But on a church level, regular church level, uh, I have never never met anyone that I could tell for any fact whatsoever was in it just for the money. And one reason is because there are much easier ways to make that same amount of money. Much, much easier ways. A preacher's life, I know it's a joke and it's a trope within our society, a preacher's life is horrible. It is grueling. It is a doctor without medicine or instruments. It is 24 hours a day, seven days a week, messed up vacations, three funerals a week. You know, it, it is a horrible, horrible, grueling life. And the statistics for marriage, for divorces, for um, mental illness issues, it, it, it bears it out that a minister's life is a really, really, really grueling life. And there's not near as much money to be made in it until you break through and you've got television shows and, and things like that. It's not to say that a local minister can't really fleece his congregation good, but it's still, you could probably still go to work at the plant and work regular hours and make just as much money. And so I don't know a single minister that I've ever met that it was obvious they were in it for the money. doesn't mean they didn't like money, and it doesn't mean that they didn't make sure that they got their money, but I, I don't know any of them that were ever that way. Um, now, I've met some that were not humanist, for sure. You know, I've met some that did not love people the way that I thought a minister should love people. But even then, there was there was still a certain amount of sincerity for what that I mean. They they, to whatever degree, believed that they were doing something important, something that was necessary. Yeah. I, what about those thirty ministers who gathered in Nashville a few weeks ago? Their, their picture was on the front page of the paper. Praying for the bathroom bill. I mean, what the hell are they doing? Yeah. What, what, well, first off, care of? Yeah. What's it? Yeah. So first off, yeah. So so first off, I mean, that's a good question. Everybody hear the question? I'm assuming. Um, well, first off, I'll tell you they suck. You know. So I agree with you on that. Um, I think that what is happening is that the next book that I write may be something I'll entitle Amerigod. I think that Christianity has morphed 
into nothing more than a political instrument and that theology has now become so um, convoluted with political agendas that those people are not able to see how inhumane they are. That it is twisted in their minds. They think ultimately that they are defending people who are indefensible. You know, that they are defending little children and they're defending women and they're defending the dominionists. Here, here, let, let me break this down real quick. And y'all just tell me when I got to go because, you know, my flight's not till 4.30 tomorrow. So, you know, uh, something there. Wrap it up. Wrap it up. Okay. Um, I can. I don't know if y'all will find it funny or not. Is there many gamers in here? Do many people game? A few? A few? I may do that in just a minute. So, um, so, so, where was I going with that real quick? So the, the dominionist, and I think the majority of evangelical Christianity has been infected with the idea of the dominionist, and particularly the right wing side of, of the political part of Christianity. Their thought is this. Their thought is, is that all of the troubles that the United States is suffering from is because of unrighteousness by the populace, the sin of the people, and that we will never be who we want to be and will never have the blessings from God that we want to have until we lower that level of sin. And the only way to do that, apparently they've given up on trying to do that, that by being the goodest person in the neighborhood and winning you to their church and convincing you of their doctrine. The only way that we can do that is to write legislation that keeps people, that legally keeps people from sinning. And if we bring that sin level down, then God will bless the United States again. They really consider themselves to be patriots. Yeah. 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 I think these people are just stirring up trouble because of the lack of vocation. Oh, I think I think the politicians. I think that here's what I really agree with you on. I think the politicians are stirring up trouble in order to try to energize their base, and I think that the preachers have been given a position of authority in between the politicians and the voters that is not justifiable, and the politicians do get a certain amount of juice out of being in that position of power. I mean, the the preachers do get a certain amount of juice out of being in that position of power. Yeah. Okay. But when I'm defending, I'm also not talking about them. So. Okay, but excellent. I want to play that video. You're more than right. Okay, I will. I, I'll play that. You know what? I just don't think it's going to be... I, maybe it'll be fun for y'all. I don't know. So, so my son and I, we have a Patreon account, and his contribution to it is is he tortures me and makes me play video games with him. And, uh, and I'm horrible at it. And so... Oh, so this is an example. Save your applause for the end. No! 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 All right. All right. Well, well, it didn't even say nothing. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I'm driving, obviously. Jesus, take the wheel. Y'all hold your laughter. Just hang on. It gets better. No. Oh, yeah. Did I start all over? Yeah. All my all three rounds? Yeah. No, you're full. I don't know. Hang on. Wait for it. Mother! <laughs> so there you go. It's just some of the fun things we can do. Thank y'all.